everybody. This is Dr. Ilyas al Ibrashi, and we will be starting together the first recorded lecture, and we will start with Unit 13 in your book entitled Facts and Figures. And as you can see from the title, it will talk about facts, which are truths, things that everybody knows because it has these things have been proved as scientific, as mathematical, as geographic, and figures or what we call numbers. Uh, as you can see, we have here the first part. I will be telling you about what needs to be covered in this unit, the pages that need to be covered. Because as you know, we do not, we only choose certain parts to be covered in each unit. We'll start off with the first text, which is called, as you can see, Killer Technologies. Okay, you can tell from the title that it's about technology. Okay or let me make it clearer it's about technology and it is also about killer technologies okay killer technologies here does not mean technology that kills but it means as you will find out from the text that it's about technology that kills the technology that existed before okay Example, for example, what can you think of that? You can think of, for example, the black and white TV. Nobody buys a black and white TV now. Why? Because we buy smart TVs. Nobody buys an ordinary uh, phone. Why? Because we all buy smartphones. Okay, let's read. And before I read, let me tell you that this text is not for studying as a text. You do not need to know the information, but you need to know the uh, vocabulary and of course the bold words and all the exercises related to this text. You don't have to study the text. Let's read. When the steamship was introduced, it was known for blowing up. Eventually, however, the technology improved and it mostly replaced its predecessor, the sailing boat. Then along came the internal combustion engine and the steamship in turn became redundant. This is the introduction of the first technology or the first invention, which was the stream, the steamship, the ship that worked with steam, the energy of steam. And when it was first introduced or started, what happened? It used to blow up, to explode. Eventually, or in the end, this technology became better and it stopped the use of the sailing boat. It killed the sailing boat it killed its predecessor. So predecessor here means what came before it because when you have a word beginning with pre, it means before. Then what happened after that came the internal combustion engine like cars or planes or whatever. And what happened then? The steamship became redundant. Redundant is no need for it, okay? It's extra. What happened then? The petrol engine proved by far to be by far the most important technology of the early 20th century. Car ownership grew by approximately 50%. And each year between 1910 and 1930, uh, sorry, each year between 1910 and 1930, as well as replacing what came before it, this killer technology revolutionized the entire world economy in just over 20 years with its impact on transport, trade, road building, and oil. So what happened? The petrol engine was very, very successful. It was one of the most important technologies when of the early 20th century. You will find later on that this unit is mainly concerned with reading numbers and understanding numbers. So, understanding numbers means how to read a number. You can see a figure, 1, 3, 0, for example, and you know how to, you should know that it should be read as 130, for example. So, here we have the first number, which is the 20th century. 20th century, 
a century is how many years? 100 years. Early 20th century means the very first few years of the 20th century. When you want to say this century, its number is 20, you would say 20th. And car ownership, the number of people who owned cars, grew or increased by how much? Approximately, not exactly, but approximately, this is the first bold word that we have, 50% per cent, like 50 out of 100 each year. Between what? 1910 and 1930. This is how we read the year. We don't say 1910. No, we say 1910, 1930. There are other ways to read other years. We'll come to that later. So it replaced this killer technology or the petrol engine replaced or killed what came before it and it also revolutionized or made great changes in the entire world in very short in a very short time a little over 20 years it had its influence on transport trade and also on road building and oil which is petrol of course in the second half of the 20th century the transistor experienced a similar extremely fast growth. The number of transistors produced in the world has reached 10 to the power of 18. I know it's not clear, but if you look in your book, you will find here a small figure 18. This is how we read it, 10 to the power of 18. 10, 18 times, which is a lot, compared to just over a million in 1955. The average price per transistor has fallen steadily from 1 over 10 or 1 tenth of a cent in 1975 to about 1 ten millionth of a cent this year. In addition, chips critical dimensions have shrunk. So this is the second uh, invention that we have, which is the transistor. The transistor is a small unit which is put in electrical devices uh, you, if you're from the science section you would understand and it also underwent lots of development first its number increased increased to 10, 10 to the power of 80 whereas in 1955 this is how it's read 1955 it was just 1 million not only that, but the price also per or each transistor has fallen steadily. Steadily means it fell and fell and fell and kept on falling. First, it used to be 1 over 10 of a cent. That is, if you divide the cent to 10 parts, it's 1 over 10. And then its price became nothing, which is 1 10 millionth of a cent. So you cannot buy one transistor because it doesn't exist anymore. How does it exist? It exists in the form of chips, which is a silicon chip, which is made, which contains millions and billions of transistors. What happened to the size and the dimensions of the chips? They also shrunk. Shrunk is the past of shrink, which means they became very, very, very small, minute. They shrunk min how, uh, from 5,000 nanometers to slightly less than 90 nanometers since 1974 and are continuing to fall. Nanometer is a unit for measurement. It is a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. Extremely small nanotechnology. The combustion engine and transistor were core technologies that changed society. Core technologies, central, very important technologies. They changed society. They led to thousands of new developments, including mass tourism and television, respectively. But as they opened new opportunities, they also destroyed older industries. They killed them. They became what? Redundant. So, what do we have here? The effect of these two industries, the combustion engine and the transistor. The combustion engine had an effect on 
uh, mass tourism because of traveling mass tourism means traveling large people large numbers of people traveling you before that they used to travel using canals or ships or uh, very very slow ways of traveling but now you can go to Australia for example in 30 hours or so the transistor had an effect and an impact on television so respectively means in the same order the transistor had an effect on the combustion engine had an effect on mass tourism or traveling in big numbers and the transistor had an effect on the television because it made it smaller lighter more advanced at the beginning of the 21st century the internet promises to bring about as much change as anything in history this is the sign of the internet and of course the internet or the world wide web the wide world web it has changed everything in history and of course what what we're doing now is related to the internet and cannot would not have been done without the internet speeds internet speeds have increased substantially another bold word that we have to know to, has, has increased a lot has increased to a very large extent we have moved rapidly very quickly from 28.8 kilobytes per second connections to broadband in europe and in europe there was 206.2 percent growth in internet usage between 200 and 2007 so as you can see when you have zeros in years you read it as one unit two thousand not two zero 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 and when you have two zeros in the middle you also say two thousand and seven not twenty oh seven thus reaching fractionally or little less than forty percent of the population or somewhere in the region of about who can read this number 322 million people okay so now we finish the text there are some words that you need to know what you need to focus on mostly are the blue words, are the bold words approximately just over slightly less than uh, substantially fractionally somewhere in the region of and you need to know some of these uh, of the words used in the text we have here a list of the words that you need to know and the meanings of those uh, words you can stop the video here and reread what has been explained to know the meanings of the terms okay so the first number is you have you can see 10 and the little number on top and that would that would read 10 that would read 10 to the power of 18 the next number we have a decimal it would read 28.8 .8. however if there's another number another digit after the decimal point we would not say 28.18 for example but we have to say 28.18 one eight years as i said are divided to two parts so we would read this as 19 10. when we have two zeros in the middle what do we do the number is read the year is read as a whole 2007 fractions they have many ways of being read you can say what one tenth one over ten or tenth centuries or whatever the order is 20th that's right 206.2 percent what do you do with one when it is uh, an order you would say what 20 first that's right five thousand we don't say five thousands you can say thousands of people but you never put an s after hundreds or thousands you never say five hundreds or five thousands you only say five thousand nanometer of course and we know that this big figure is 
322. Do we say million or millions? Million. Okay. After that, we have the bold words from the text. I've already explained those words. You should stop your video here and look at your book and try to match the uh, on page 79 and try to match the meanings with the terms uh, and then after you do that you can look and check your answers please do not Look at those answers unless you try to do them first as if you're exactly you're in class so that it would be beneficial. Okay, this, this is a very important exercise and it could be, uh, it should be very well studied. After that, we have an audio script. The audio script here also talks about uh, numbers and it talks about trends. We will find this audio script on page 163 and you can you also have the audio I think so you can listen or you can listen to reading to my reading now it's an interview between an interviewer and a producer of music and it starts off with so what difference will the internet have on the people on the way people buy music well, like everywhere else, downloads of singles are growing rapidly in Ireland. You have, of course, you can have an album or a single song. So people are doing what they're downloading from the Internet, the singles. They accounted for about 45% of singles sold last year. And that was from legal sites like iTunes. Accounted for, responsible for, they are responsible for. The real figure, we said before, what's figure? Number. The real figure for downloads is probably a lot higher when you think of file sharing, P2P, and so on. So it's a problem for the music stores, but they aren't too worried. Sales of singles in store have dropped slightly, but album sales have crashed, haven't crashed like they have in the UK. And overall, turnover has stayed more or less the same. So here he's talking about the sales of uh, music albums because they have dropped, they have become less because people now hardly buy, they download. Sometimes you can download and also there are other ways which is file sharing, sharing a file, P2P. Of course, because this is an old book, they no longer they have not mentioned other ways of downloading songs using all the different ways like uh, all the different uh, platforms on Instagram or uh, or uh, Facebook or uh, YouTube of course so this is a very old way of downloading however what we care for here is words like dropped slightly they dropped they decreased but a little bit slightly however the other word is crashed. When you say sales have crashed, that means they have dropped and dropped to a large extent. Overall, generally, turnover has stayed more or less the same. It hasn't changed a lot. So why is that? If music sales in the rest of Europe have fallen substantially, maybe we should also highlight this part. Okay, they have fallen substantially that means they underwent a very how do we do that which it should be okay let me try this one here is it they have fallen substantially that means they have decreased and they have decreased a lot substantially why hasn't there been a significant drop there a significant drop why isn't there a big decrease significant I think it's the way we think of our music we think of uh, and we think in terms of albums not singles there in Ireland it could all change of course but for the moment now it's albums that people want so in Ireland people do not uh, download because they like to own the album 
the number of people with broadband is growing gradually. Here's another trend growing gradually. That means it's increasing and it's increasing uh, very slowly. But there are still lots of places where broadband isn't available. So it's a lot quicker just to it's a lot quicker just to drive to the local music store. At that time, when this text was written, the internet was slow. So what to do? Is it better to download and it would take a long time to download or just do what? Go to the music store. So as a music producer, do you see the internet as a threat? Yes and no. P2P and file sharing will always be a problem for the big music retailers, those who sell music. But I think the internet is a fantastic tool uh, not just for letting people hear your music, think of artists like Nas Barkley and Arctic Monkeys. If you want to make a single yourself and get yourself heard, broadband and digital technology make it a lot easier and it means that the number of artists has risen substantially. Okay, let's mark this as well. People are listening to different sounds and that can only be a good thing. So, what do we need out of this text? Do we need to know what kind of music is happen what is happening to music downloads in Ireland no we just need to know the trends what's a trend it's the way things are increasing or decreasing are they are they increasing quickly or slowly are they dropping quickly or are they dropping slowly and all right now suppose you've finished your exercises now let's look at the The first answer that we have is fast big fall is a crash or a significant drop. And then we have slow small fall, drop slightly. No change is stay the same. And then slow small rise is grow gradually. Fast big rise is rise substantially or grow rapidly. Exercise eight oil prices shoots up this is a fast big rise gold plummets plummets means it falls very hard very quickly it's a fast big fall there a significant increase there are worrying signs of a significant increase that would be fast big rise doctors express a con concern at a noticeable rise fast big rise noticeable you can see it it's changing very quickly a slight fall, not a big fall, just a slight fall, slow, small fall. All quiet as FTSE levels off, levels off, you should know this expression, means what? No change. Substantial drop, substantial is big, so it's a fast big fall. Cost of borrowing rockets, rockets is like a rocket, so this is a fast big rise. More exercises about uh, the numbers. Okay, you have here, you go to the practice file and you have more exercises related to numbers, which we have already discussed. And you can go to uh, this exercise and try to do it yourself. Okay. On page 78 and on page 89, we have tips. Tips means small parts of information that you should know because it makes a difference in understanding the language. On page 82, you have by and from to. When you say car ownership grow, grew by approximately 50%, that means you're referring here to an initial figure and from refers to an initial figure and to to a final figure so when i say the price has fallen steadily from one over ten to one tenth of a million that means it started off at x and then it developed to y but here grew by approximately 50 percent that means that this is the difference so that means it used to be um, 30 and then it became 80, so the difference is 50%. Do you follow? So when you say grew by, it shows the difference. When you say from to, it shows the first figure and the final figure. 
The next tip that we have on page 79 is the difference between supposedly and apparently. When you use the word supposedly, you use it when a fact is not yet proven. Apparently, when you are repeating something that you heard and you, it is all fa a fact, just like what happened, we'd say supposedly uh, uh, the lectures will be online. That means we're not really sure, but there is a doubt. We're not sure, supposedly. Once the schools and the universities close, we'd say apparently we have to go online. So the difference between supposedly is when it is not a fact, it's just uh, a sort of uh, something that needs to be proved, and apparently is when it has been proved and it, you're repeating something that you have heard. Is this clear? Okay. Now we go to the business communication skills on page 78. This would... Here we have also, as you can see, the title is Exchanging Information, Asking for and Explaining Factual and Numerical Information. Factual information is information that is related to a fact, something that is information that is real, it has been proved. Numerical information is information, but it is not general, info, it is information related to numbers. Okay, when you say uh, uh, in the, the population of a country is 40 million, this is numerical information. When you say this country is uh, in the Northern Hemisphere or is in the continent of Africa, this is factual information. In this uh, audio script, you will find lots of media terms that you should know. Let's read the context first. Carolyn Rogers works for SirAuto.com a motor insurance company specializing in affordable insurance for young drivers. The company is considering new ways of reaching its target audience. And Carolyn recently attended a seminar on online advertising. So we're talking here about a company that is going to change, that, that is working, that its uh, field is insurance for young drivers, it's affordable, that means anybody can afford it, anybody can pay for it, and they want to reach the target audience. Of course, their audience are uh, young people, they cannot use traditional advertising, so they want to use new types of advertising, like for example, the internet. As we read, we will find these media terms that you need to know, a blog, a blog is a web log or a web page written by individuals, either about their own lives or a topic or an issue they're interested in. So you can have a blog, you're interested in cars, for example. So you would have a blog about cars and the more people visit it, the more advertisements you can have. What kind of, because those who visit you will be those who are interested in cars. So maybe a company that is related to insurance or related to selling cars or renting cars, they can advertise on your blog and you can make money uh, this way. Another media term that we will read is podcasts. And these are often audio files that are delivered to users via subscription, often free. So they are, uh, for example, a song that you, would, you can download, but before downloading, you have to subscribe. How do you subscribe? You don't pay money usually. You just write your name, your email, your interests. So this information can be used by other companies. This is a podcast. RSS feeds, these are files which contain a small amount of information and they are sent to users to encourage them to visit bigger sites. You know, when you're the, on Facebook and you see a small sponsored ad or something that appears on the uh, right side of the screen saying, for example, uh, the death of uh, this actor. And then you get interested, you click on this uh, part and you would find that there is a small piece of information and then you would find other advertisements. So you start reading, but you also get to look at the advertisements. These are called RSS feeds, 
And all of these, the blogs, the bot podcasts, the RSS feeds, and as I said, these are very old fashioned. All these are called user generated media. So why are they called user generated media? Because they're created by online users and for online users. Like Facebook, for example, it's created by online users and it's only used by for it's only uh, it can it's only important for online use. If you stop using it because you're not online, then it will be useless. You're supposed to know all of these definitions. You can be asked about not the definition as such because you know the exam is multiple choice, but you can be asked about the definitions and you would need to say if it's true or false, or of if I say, for example, uh, files which contain small amount of information are podcasts, then you should say, no, they're not. Okay. All of these uh, terms you can find in the audio script. We'll go now to page 163. However, you have it here in front of you on the screen. Uh, as you're not supposed to know the information in the audio script, you're only supposed to know the terms and some of the highlighted words. Again, it's an interview. Could you fill us in on the most relevant information from the seminar? Could you fill us in on? Which means, could you give us the information? Could you detail us? Could you update us on what happened in the seminar. Sure, it was extremely informative and basically it gave us an overview of figures regarding advertising via blogs and podcasts. Informative, full of information. It gave us an overview, a general idea. Blogs and podcasts I've already explained. Interesting, what did you find out? Well, in general, Traditional forms of advertising to our 18 to 30s market. This is the age group that the 1830s, that means from the people who are 18 years old till 30 years old, are becoming less effective. Traditional forms of advertising. Do you ever read the newspaper? Do you ever uh, listen to the radio? Uh, and or So now where do we find, where can I advertise to attract your attention? the internet so that's not effective they are saying that the way ahead is to advertise where our target audience are hanging out which is on blogs and podcasts so hanging out it's between inverted commas because it's not really hanging out you know when you say uh, i'm going to sit on the facebook for sit on i'll meet you on facebook it's like a virtual place where you can meet your friends so what are the facts and figures? Give me uh, some proofs. Give me things that I understand. Give me numbers and give me facts. Apparently, a recent study shows a huge increase in advertising investment via this media just in the last year. In fact, spending went up to 20.4 million. What's that in terms of growth? So that means here he's asking for numerical or factual information when he says what's that in terms of growth? When the answer is it's 19, 198.4%. This is numerical or factual? Numerical, of course, that's right. So the growth is 198.4, which is pretty incredible. Pretty incredible means it's unbelievable. It's too much. That sounds very promising. Yes, one of the presenters, Simon Darby, said companies were investing fast and that we should take this opportunity before our competitors do. Okay, how do these figures compare with the different user-generated media? Do you remember when we described or when we explained what user-generated media means? Who remembers? It is the oh, everything that is made by online users and for online online users. Apparently, Renata did not understand, and she says user-generated media meaning 
What do you mean? Okay, I mean things like blogs, podcasts, RSS feeds. These are the media terms that you're supposed to know. Ah, okay, thanks. Okay, we resume the audio script. Yes, uh, Simon claimed last year blog advertising accounted for. We said before accounted for means was responsible for 81.4% of collective spending on user generated media. Collective, overall, all. But roughly speaking, by 2010, how do we read this year? 2010, it will only be 39.7%. Okay, roughly speaking, roughly speaking means more or less, approximately. It's not a, an accurate number. And remember, 39.7%, and if there is, it's 1.7, so it would be 39.17, not 39.17. You must remember this. So how should we interpret this drop? Interpret? How can we? explain this drop how can we decipher this drop how what is your what is the reason for this drop well supposedly you remember the tip supposedly podcast advertising will be the front runner front runner when there's a race and you come first you're the front runner you came first the first over the next four years overtaking exceeding coming before spending on blog ads can we look at the figures, numbers? Yes, I have them here on this graph. According to a recent survey, when you are quoting, when you are referring to a fact, you need to give evidence, a proof. So you can say, according to the teacher, according to my mother, according to a recent survey, total projected, expected future expenditure on blog advertising will reach $300.4 dollars, not 300s, 300.4 million, 300.4 million in four years, not millions. Whereas expenditure or spending on podcast advertising will have grown at an annual compound rate of 154.4 percent to 327 million so this is the growth rate so the bottom line the conclusion is that user-generated media will be our new advertising platform whether we like it or not this is where we will go place this is our venue if you want to advertise, you have to go to media, that is by online users and for online users. That's right. Simon assured us that this form of advertising more or less somewhat guarantees we reach our target audience. Can you give us the lowdown on the types of companies advertising through this media? Carolyn, sure. The overriding trend is for technology. Overriding trend means the uh, trend that, is, that comes first. The trend that is most successful is for technology, car, and media brands to use this form of advertising. I've got examples of these companies here. So here the lowdown means the summary, the most important facts. Okay, what are we supposed to know out of this audio script? You're supposed to know the highlighted words, and you are also supposed to know the uh, how to talk about trends. And this audio script is here to lead us to the grammar lesson, which is about future, and uh, you will know now in the coming uh, slides. Okay, on page 81, you will have the, you have here the key expressions, how to ask for factual information, how to ask for numerical information, and how to report, how to say what you heard, according to, apparently, supposedly, claim, assure, and how to summarize, bottom line, overriding trend, in general, so on. These you're supposed to read. 
I can ask you in the exam. If you want to report, you can say. So you have to know them. Read them very carefully. Okay? Okay. Now, if you go to the practice file, page 126, to practice the trends leveled substantially somewhere, approximately, gradually, fractionally, shot, past of shoot, gradual, significant, you need to answer this exercise. You should stop the video now and try to answer the exercise. Look, take, get a pen and paper and open your books, page 126, and start answering this exercise. After you finish, then you come back to the video and check your answers. So stop now and go and answer the exercises. Okay. So again, these are the answers. One, substantially. Two, leveled. Three, a gradual decline. Four, shot. Five, approximately. Six, fractionally less than. Seven, a significant fall. Eight, gradually. And nine, somewhere. What were you supposed to do? You were supposed to read those graphs and to see this company, XTU, to read the increase and decline and to see this company web mix and read the increase and the decline. There is another uh, exercise on page 126 that is related to the uh, trends and how we can uh, try to choose the correct word. Let's do this together now orally. I will read and give you a minute to answer. Roughly spoken or speak or speaking by 2020 it will be up 25%. Roughly? That's right, speaking. Accord or according or accorded to a recent study? According to a recent study. So what are the facts and numbers, amounts, figures? What, is the, what does the expression say? What are the facts and figures? So do we say the final line or the bottom line or the end line? What did we say in the text? It is the bottom line or the conclusion. So how should we uh, interpret this drop? Six, can you give us the summary, the rundown, or the turn downturn, or the lowdown on the types of advertising available? What's the correct choice? That's right, the lowdown. In generally, or in general, or in generality, of course, it is in general. Okay, now we come to page 127, which is the reported speech review, which is how to report something that you have heard. Report means repeat something that you have heard. Okay, reported speech. Now, in business English, this is very simple. You will find that it's much simpler than in school. You have to know these terms, reporting speech, reporting verbs first. If you want to report what it was said, you say, you use these verbs, say, tell, explain, point out. He said that. He told me that. If you want to report a thought, he thinks that. He knows that. He believes. He doesn't believe that. He realized that. 
If you want to report a request, ask, wonder, I wanted to know if. Reporting orders, he told me, he ordered me. So here you have to know verbs and what do you, how do you use these verbs? Do they report speech, thought, request or orders? Okay. Main tense changes in standard report speech when the reporting verb is in the past tense. What does that mean? It means that the main tense of the verb, past, present, so on, changes in standard reporting speech, which means that the main tense of uh, the verb changes when the reporting verb is in the past tense. So if the actual words are in the present tense, they change to the past. For example, if they are in the past con present continuous, they change to the past continuous. For example, I am driving home. Can you see this uh, example? Now this is direct. You can see the two inverted commas. Now when you report this speech, you would say, he said... What's the tense here? Am driving. Present continues. It becomes was driving. He said that he was driving home or he said he was driving home. Both are correct. Here, what is the tense? Didn't. It's in the past tense. So what do you do when you report the past tense? You go back to your table. Past tense is changed to the past perfect. He didn't see her. He hadn't seen her. In the past perfect. It's been raining. What's the tense here? It has been raining. Has been raining. This is has been raining. Present perfect continuous. It becomes past perfect continuous. Had been raining. I am going. Present continuous. It becomes what? Past continuous. He was going. So the first few are very normal. You have present becomes past, present continuous becomes past continuous, past simple becomes past perfect, past continuous becomes past perfect continuous. Uh, so for example, was coming, uh, uh, this is in the past continuous, okay, and then it changes to the past perfect continuous. Okay, had been coming. Past present perfect continuous becomes past perfect continuous. The present perfect becomes past perfect. Why doesn't the past perfect change? It become no change because this is the oldest tense. There is nothing before it. There is nothing older. So when you have past perfect or past perfect continuous, no change. Am going becomes or is going or are going becomes was or were. Will becomes would. And this is different imperative becomes infinitive, such as come here, come imperative. I'm giving an order. Don't come here. He told me not to come here. So imperative, come here. He told me not to come. Come is imperative to come. Sorry, come here. He told me to come here. Don't come here. He told me not to come here. Okay, so again, when you have a sentence in the imperative, I'm giving an order, come here. When you're reporting it, he told me not to come here. Imperative, don't come here. How do you change it to the reported speech? He told me not to come here. Also, the modal verbs, they change in the same manner, can becomes good. May becomes might, must becomes, you, there is nothing called musted, had to, need, needed, and will becomes would. Now, number four is very important. Let's read it together. If the reporting verb is in the present tense and the situation is still current, then you don't change the tense. How do you know that? How do you do that? I like working here. He says, can you see the reporting verb here? It's in the present tense. He says he really likes. We haven't changed it. Here it's in the present tense. And here it's also in the present tense. Uh, I am a mother of two. I am. 
she says she is a mother of two. We do not change the tense here. It remains the same. It does not change from present to past. Just like the rule says, why? The rule here says present becomes past. But we are talking here ab about a current situation, something that is still happening. In this case, there is no change. I like, he likes. No change in the tense. To report WH questions, you repeat the question word. This is very easy. When is Jane going? He asked me. Uh, what do you do that? Here you use the use you use the question word when, and then you change it to a sentence, not to a question. So you change the tense when is it becomes was, and then you change it to a sentence. Is Jane was going? You don't say. He asked me when was Jane going because in this case you will have a question. No, we want to change it to a sentence. Do you see a question mark here? No. Why? Because this is a sentence, a statement. So that's why you will change the order of the verb. It will be a simple sentence. Jane was going, not was Jane going. When there is a direct question, like, has Bill spoken to you? You want to report it? What do you use? You can you use here the word if or whether. He asked me if Bill had spoken to me or whether Bill had spoken to me. What happened to the tense here? Has spoken becomes had spoken. And what do you do? You remove the question mark. No question mark. Sometimes there are, sometimes you can repeat all of this, but in a summarized way. You're speaking, so you want to be, to be as short as possible. So you can use verbs to summarize what people say. Like, for example, and here this has to be studied. If it doesn't come to you naturally, you have to study it. You can say, deny instead of saying uh, I he said that he did not do it you can just say he denied that he did it so you see it becomes shorter summarized some verbs are followed by that some verbs are followed by someone and that like he warned me that he advised me that some verbs are followed by an infinitive. He agreed to come. She agreed to see me. Some verbs are followed by ing, like he advised, uh, they admitted leaving. They uh, admitted, uh, they, uh, what else? They uh, admitted, uh, not admitted, they said, or apologized for coming, they denied stealing, and sometimes you have verb plus someone plus infinitive like they have invited us to visit, infinitive. As you can see, for example, the, word, the verb deny, you can say he denied that he came, and you can say he denied coming. So in this case, both are correct. You can say, he denied that he came, and you can say, he denied coming, okay? Uh, you can also say, uh, he advised that, he denied that he advised us, and you can also say, or he denied that he advised us, and you can also say, use advise with an infinitive. He advised someone, uh, and then you put the infinitive to come. So here you'll say, he advised me to come, and you can say he, he advised that I should come. This part, this number seven, is very important. If it doesn't come to you naturally, please study it well. After studying the grammar lesson and reading and rereading it, you have to take some time to look at the following exercises on page 127. What are you supposed to do here? You're supposed to rewrite the sentences beginning with the words given. You will stop the video now and try to do this exercise. I'll do the first one with you. 
In the first one, he says, The plan will not work. I thought. I didn't think. Huh? The plan, or I didn't think that. The plan will becomes would work. Why didn't I say would not work? Because I used didn't in the beginning. So, as we agreed, you stop the video now and you start changing, using, changing it to the reported speech. And remember, when you come to a sentence like this one, she says, for example, remember, we do not change the tense. Okay, turn the video off now. Okay, hello again. Let's go through the, uh, the answers. Number one, my boss always says, always says that I will not change the tense here. She doesn't believe in working at weekends. Send the letter immediately becomes, he told me, to send, imperative, becomes infinitive. Have you been waiting for long? She asked me, she said to me, she asked me, this is a sentence, yes, no question, if have you becomes had been waiting, have you been waiting becomes had been waiting, and so on and so forth. Okay, check your answers, please. Stop the videos and check your answers. Another exercise that you have here is the... One, the following one on page 127, it's related to summaries. What you're supposed to do here is you have six sentences and six summaries. Okay. Which one here fits the summary? That means go for it. You're an ideal candidate. What's he doing here? Go for it. You're an ideal candidate. He is encouraging. So because he's encouraging... B would be the summary. Encourage, apply for the job. Let me give you a hand with that. What is he doing here? Let me offer to help. And so on. Okay, stop the video now and try to match these with their summaries and then check your answers. Now we need to write those summaries. So, for example... Number one would be, he denied being responsible. You can also say he denied that he was responsible. But which is shorter? He denied being responsible, that's four words. Or he denied that he was responsible, that's six words. So that's why we're trying to make it as short as possible. Okay, number two. He encouraged me to apply for the job. Number three, refuse let use computer. He refused to let me use his computer. How would you do offer for how did you do offer for offer help? You're supposed to have answered. He, he offered to help me. You can also say he offered his help. This is also possible. Apologize, be late. He apologized for being late. Agree, lend money. Which is, I'm pleased to say, we can offer you the loan. Instead of saying, they uh, uh, said that they were pleased uh, to, uh, to offer me, that they can offer me the loan. You can just do it as short as, he agreed to lend me the money. If you go back to the book, you will find similar exercises where you need to report what was said to the manager. Again, this is the best practice. You stop your, your video and start answering those questions on page 82. I'll do the first one with you. Contact Helen immediately if you have any problems. We want to start all sentences with my manager. My manager told me to contact Helen immediately if you becomes I, I have becomes had, 
had any problems? Of course, you can have a number of answers, such as, my manager said to contact Helen immediately if I had any problems. Okay. Finish the exercise and then come and check your answers. Here's another answer. My manager told me he always feels a bit nervous when he gets on a plane or my manager says he always feels a bit nervous when he gets on a plane. You can say told me or says. Okay, the next question on the same page, page 82, is also about summarizing. You remember, summarizing is using as few words as possible. Like, I'm really grateful for your help. Instead of saying, he said that he was really grateful for my help. What is he doing here? He's thanking me. So, he thanked me for helping him. Stop your video and start answering. As you can see here, answers may vary according to the choice of the pronoun. It depends how you look at the sentence. Come back and check your answers. Two, go on, apply for the promotion. She encouraged me to apply. I haven't I'm afraid I haven't finished the report yet. He's apologizing. I apologized for not finishing the report. No, no, this mistake was not my responsibility at all. He's denying here, so how can you put it in the shortest way possible? He denied responsibility. Or he denied he was responsible, but this is shorter. I want to do your shift for Friday refuse i won't do your shift for friday he refused to do her shift or you can say he refused to do his shift whatever i can reduce the price by 200 euros offer he offered to reduce the price okay i see your point and i look at the terms and conditions again he agreed now all this long sentence can be summarized to he agreed to look at the terms. I will just ignore this part because okay means agree. I see your point means agree. So all of this has been changed to agreed. And this is, we come now to the end of the unit. I will recapitulate or summarize what we have done. In this unit, you're supposed to read the first text well and to know the terms, to know how to read numbers, you should know how to read fractions, you should know how to read decimals, you should know how to read years, practice, uh, you should know how to read uh, currency, money, okay, practice fractions, you're all, you're all very well read in math, uh, and then you're supposed to know the audio scripts and to know how to read and to express trends, and to know the media generated uh, those uh, files or those uh, uh, ways of uh, using the user media generated files such as the media the blog and the rss and the podcast and so on and to know the terminology in these this two these two audio scripts and after that you're supposed to know the grammar and how to use the reported speech verbs and how to summarize them so that they would be uh, easy to communicate because this is what language is all about. Some tips are here also for you to understand and to know such as the difference between apparently and supposedly and so on. I hope you enjoyed the lesson. I hope you understood every part of it. If you have any problems we can always have some sort of communication. Maybe I can provide an email or a group or something where you can ask me any questions and we'll go now in the next uh, video to the next unit which is unit 15 performance thank you very much and enjoy stay safe stay at home be very careful 
and study well. Thank you.